Micah 5, and you all said 6, so we'll go back to Micah 5, 6. 5, 6. Micah 5, 6. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nim... Do what? Somebody say? Oh, I don't know. And the, uh, the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. Notice some things in here. And they shall waste the land of Assyria. We've covered Assyria. You all know where Assyria is. You got the Tiger and the Euphrates. It goes up and then you know where Haran is. That's where Abraham was from. If you're making that curve and then you would come back down through Damascus into Israel. Assyria is on the uh, Euphrates River between the Euphrates and Tigris there and that's the capital Nineveh and right there is uh, that's the, the hot spot. Now he talks about the land of Nimrod. Nimrod you know where he is. He's not in Assyria. So he's joined two things together that don't really belong together. Assyria is not part of Nimrod's territory. Nimrod's territory was Babel. Uh, and that's on the lower end there, down by the uh, Gulf of Aquaba. Okay, so um, he's told you about two different things because there's two different deliverances. Now he's not really mentioned them going into Babylon yet. And that's kind of a hint that something else beyond Assyria is going to happen. And it will. To make the prophecy historic to 2 Kings 19 is a fail. <laughs> no Jew wasted the land of Assyria. What happens when they go into captivity to Assyria? They're later taken again by Babylon. Babylon takes over. And then from there, Persia and the Medes take over. So never does Israel come out and waste anybody. They get wasted nonstop. So this has to be a prophecy of something future. Um, the, the way that uh, most of the commentators are going to tell you this works is they'll say that um, the we is Trinity. And sometimes that's so, but not so here. And in verse 4, Christ is the man. All right, God speaks of Israel as his people, my land. He owns it. He has ownership of it. But when we find we in our land and that type of thing, that's referring to a human, not God. When God talks about it, he owns it. Um, it's, it would be we as in a group when Israel, as Israelites, are on the land. Um, because he's not giving it to one individual person. He's given it to a nation of people. And not really given it, uh, allowed them to sit there. Because he says, if you don't live right, I'll kick you out of my land. Hmm. So they didn't really get much ownership of it. It's kind of like they do here in our town. You can own your house outright, pay for it. But you'll never really own it. Because you keep paying property tax. It ain't their property anymore. <laughs> Why are you getting taxed on it? And if you don't pay. Yeah. No, no. You find out who owns it. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Oh, this is why I told you I was going to tell you about Cyrus. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Micah talks there in verse 5 and 6, he talks about, um, Thus shall he deliver us. The he there is not Christ, like most people are trying to make it out to be. Um, the reference is to a man in Israel. He says, uh, Thus shall he deliver us. Who is this he? The he is a savior, but not the savior, who comes in and delivers, helps deliver Israel. Now we could say it's, we don't know exactly. It could be Daniel. You remember Daniel prays in Babylon, but that's not Assyria. Babylon helps, uh, or Daniel helps deliver when he's in Babylon. He does the formula that Solomon gave them. Uh, they pray toward the city and 
confess their sins and then God forgives his people and restores them to the land. Okay, that's true, but that's still another captivity away from Assyria. The man could be in Isaiah 45, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. Now we think of anointed as being, you know, someone, a good guy. This is not a good guy. To Cyrus. Huh? He says, I picked Cyrus to do a job. And he's going to do this job. This is what election is. I know we're stepping into Calvin again. <laughs> election is, I've given you a mission to do. I think that everybody that moves on this globe is elect of God to do something. First of all, to get saved except his son. And then it's your job to get busy. He's got a, a, a program. He's already laid out for everybody to be working. That's what the millennium will be. Uh, Cyrus. He says, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of the kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and that would be in Babylon, and the gates shall not be shut. Cyrus is anointed. Now I'm going to tell you some interesting things about Cyrus. I, I tried this week to go through and whittle it down. It's a big, long story. <laughs> Basically, here's what happens. His father um, has a daughter, it's, well, I guess it's his grandfather, has a daughter, and he has this dream that his grandson is going to take over. And so he does what any fine upstanding man back then did with their children. <laughs> he sent her off to the Medes. And there, uh, she has a baby, sure enough. And so when she comes to her, is it, do I have the Medes and the Persians backwards? I might have. Uh, I think he's Persian. He sends her off to the Medes or maybe the other way around. I can't remember right now. I've seen too many things. <laughs> so anyway, the, the baby is born. And he says to his uh, servant, I want the child killed. Is this sounding like anybody to you? It's just like Moses. And you know what happens? Just like Moses, he's not killed. He's saved. Uh, you find that two or three places in the Bible where a child is supposed to be killed and he's not killed and he comes out to prominence. And he comes back in and then he finally has a war with Grandpa. <laughs> and it's not too vicious. Grandpa capitulates and he gets both Medes and Persians. Because they sent him off there, he marries a girl over there, so he can unite both kingdoms, North and South, or uh, Mede and Persian. So that could be the anointed that is saving them, and he does. He delivers Israel, and he tells Israel, everybody who wants to go back, go back and I'll help you. And he does. Now, not many of them go back, but that's up to them. But I don't think that's who he's talking to either, because that's still two deliverances away. In our passage here, he's referring to Assyria. Assyria, I don't, I don't really have an answer for you. Look at 2 Kings 17. Second Kings 17, verse 4. This obviously cannot be the answer, but we'll start somewhere. <laughs> 2 Kings 17, 4. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea. For he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no present to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. So that, no pun intended, so the king of, of Egypt was supposed to be a deliverer for Israel. The king in Israel said, hey, Assyria is knocking on my door. We've been paying them tribute, but I think I can get a better deal with Egypt. <laughs> Everybody's looking for a good deal. You know how you save money? They, they put on the commercials that you've saved thousands of dollars when you just spent thousands of dollars. Uh, <laughs> but that's what he was doing. He was trying to uh, get protection from Egypt. Now, Egypt's never a good guy. Um, the indication is the man-child... Um, who succeeds to temporary peace is similar to what we find with the Antichrist. 
the Antichrist shows up and he gives Israel a, a sort of peace. He lets them back in their land, lets them worship again, uh, signs a contract with them, and it seems like he's going to be a deliverer, but he won't for long. Soon he changes his mind. Lamentations 4, look at verse 20. Lamentations 4, verse 20. We'll get Jeremiah's opinion on the same situation. Lamentations 4.20 The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, okay, there's an anointed of the Lord, and it's not Cyrus, it predates Cyrus, was taken in their pits, of whom we said under, the, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Okay, is that um, Hosea? Hosea? Hos Hosea? Whatever that king was? <laughs> that went to, to Egypt. Maybe they were thinking we're down here at the end. They've been keeping us um, from having to pay tribute money to Assyria. This king is gonna be our deliverer. You know, like a bunch of Americans thought about Trump. Trump is going to be our, uh, there ain't no deliverer in America, but Jesus Christ. Amen. The same one wherever you are on any spot on the globe. That's Daniel 11. Here's the Antichrist. Daniel 11, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, until he offers them some. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He can compliment them till he's blue in the face, and or till they're blue in the face while he's taking money out of their wallet. And that's what he does. He's a smooth talker. Over and over the Bible tells you, be careful of fair speeches and smooth words. They're designed usually to trick you. They throw you off balance. We like comfortable things. It's uncomfortable to hear someone who can't speak well. That's what Moses' problem was. He says, don't send me down there to all those people. I can't even talk. God says, uh, you want to bet, you'll do the talking. He brings in Aaron. I always get a real kick out of this. He brings in Aaron. He says, I'll let Aaron be your spokesperson. Go through the story. Aaron doesn't get to say a word. <laughs> Moses suddenly uh, ascends to his call. <laughs> it's like, like uh, who is it? Isaiah says, the, or I think it was Jeremiah. I said, I won't speak anymore, but I, I was burning like a, a fire was in me, and I had to come out. <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> and that's the way it is. Daniel 9, look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the seven years. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years later, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So part of the agreement had to be they can sacrifice in the temple again. And for the overspreading of, the, of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even into the consumption. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, that's how it's going to wind up. What they thought was going to be their redemption and peace on earth and Messiah didn't end up being. There's been many messiahs that are phony that have showed up on this globe. And it seems like always before the genuine is the counterfeit. And I think of Cyrus as being a counterfeit. I'll, maybe I'll do it sometime. You really, it's fun to learn all the history of these ancients. Um, there's a lot of uh, ancient history that you're not given in the Bible that is part of it. Um, the other kings. If you follow that line, after Cyrus, it becomes a vicious nation. And uh, the way it ends up is the final king is, uh, when he goes into battle, his enemy he kills by lashing him to two ships in in the harbor and letting the tide stretch him apart uh, people have been vicious in history anytime even though the beginning of that cyrus you would have thought was good but don't be looking at a man a man can't save anybody when cyrus said if anybody wants to go back to israel they should have all hightailed it within 30 40 years it, it is taken over by um 
eventually it'll get taken over by Alexander the Great, um, and then then it's uh, then it's Greece's turn. Micah, Micah five verse seven. And the remnant of Jacob. Okay, so that tells us not all of Israel. That's just a small portion. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord. As the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man nor waiteth for the sons of men. This dew in the midst of... You're getting the picture that they're going to be in the midst of people that are not their own people. A bunch of heathens. They're getting scattered. And that's exactly what happens. Hosea, Hosea 14, verse 5. Here's a similar verse, but we'll notice the difference. Hosea 14, verse 5. He said, I will be as the dew unto Israel, God speaking. Now that's not what our verse said. Our verse said, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew. So now they're as the dew instead of God saying, I'm the dew. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Okay, as the dew from the Lord and the showers upon the grass in verse 7. All the commentators can make a spiritual application and anybody can make a spiritual application out of anything. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not, but uh, that, that, that's just how you, based on whether or not you understand the rest of the Bible. Here's, here's a line you'll hear. The blessed refreshing influence of the invigorating life-giving power of the Lord that liberates the truths of Christ's gospel. That's what the do is. <laughs> that's what we were talking about earlier. Fair words and smooth speeches means nothing <laughs> and there ain't no church in that now what most commentators will do is they'll run you back there anything that's positive in the Old Testament they suddenly want to claim for themselves and so anytime they see Israel about to get a blessing or it looks like they're getting one they say well that's talking to me <laughs> no it's not if you're gonna take the blessings you better take the cursings too because Israel's going through it Joel chapter 2 Joel 2 verse 23 Joel 2 verse 23 Be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month it's not supposed to happen that way <laughs> you're not supposed to get a deluge he says I'm doing this on purpose so that you'll notice something you'll notice this is a sign Joel you know what Joel is Turn to Acts. Acts 2. We're going off script here, so. <laughs> Acts 2. Um, Acts 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. Okay, I'm going to back up and I'm going to give you what's going on here so you see it. This is the day of Pentecost. Verse, uh, let's pick it up at verse um, 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They've, everybody's been hearing the gospel that's being preached in their own language and they're looking at each other saying what in the world is all of this and somebody makes a joke and says they must be drunk on grape juice obviously they were known for not drinking alcohol he says they're drunk on new wine not they're drunk now Peter gets up he continues the joke he says this but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them you men of Judah and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem be this known unto you and hearken unto my words for these are not drunken as you suppose seeing it is but the third hour of the day that's his joke it's not happy hour yet they can't be drunk 
Uh, it's not saying um, a doctrinal statement. Now he's soon to start his speech. He's a good, good speaker. He says a joke, got, some, got them all comfortable and laughing, and now he's going to lower the boom. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That verse right there is after the paragraph mark that's in verse 14. So we're in a new subject now. He opened with a joke. Now his sermon begins. He would have preached this sermon had there been anybody speaking in tongues or not. The this is that which is spoken by Joel is the next statement he's going to make, not the previous event that has happened uh, by Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Where in there does he say that everybody's going to speak in tongues? That wasn't part of the message. People, your charismatic will try to join those two together, but they don't join. When he says in uh, verse 16, this is that which is spoken by Joel, the prophet, that's how he begins a sermon and he goes to his sermon. It doesn't have anything to do with the speaking in tongues. Okay, um, now why did I go there? Um, uh, Revelation. Oh, because we're in Joel. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll be... Um, I don't know. At some point, we'll be back there. Revelation. Uh, Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 9. In Joel, he told you, I gave you the former and the latter rain at the same time. Now, we understand the tribulation is not the devil's doing. It's God's doing. He's forcing the devil to do what he wants him to do. And watch this thing right here, verse 9. And the great dragon uh, was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. Um, yeah, where is it? 16. 16. Oh, I'm on the wrong side of the page. <laughs> Okay, verse, pick, back it up to verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away with the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So that could be the former and the latter rain that are supposed to come in one month all at once. Um, I'm not sure that's iffy thing. You can decide whether you want it to fit or not. <laughs> but we know that is a sign in the tribulation that deliverance is coming. Um, and then Micah 5, Micah 5, verse 8. I'll just give you Matthew Henry. Y'all know who he is. Um, he has some good practical things to say. Don't listen to a word he says when he touches on anything doctrinal. He believes in replacement theology. All the way through there, if you travel anything in the Old Testament, he replaces Israel with the church. Here's what he says about verse 7. The remnant of Jacob is actually the church, dispersed like gold in the ore, or wheat in the heap. Uh -uh. The remnant always refers to Israel. Never did God call the church the remnant. No, we're his bride. Uh, he's not going to have a, a harem that gets whittled down. <laughs> we're the bride, the one. Uh, Micah 5, verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, 
Okay, that means they've been dispersed with Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beast of the forest. Who's the lion that's, a, that's the beast in the forest? Okay, the forest is the, the pre-existing um, thing in our, our analogy and the lion is a remnant. There's only one lion or a few lions versus forest. So the analogy is Jacob is the few, the Gentile is the many, so Jacob is the lion hmm. among the flock of sheep, who if he go through both treadeth down and teareth in pieces and none can deliver. So here he's saying that uh, Israel's going to come through and destroy the people they've been dispersed amongst. That's never happened. That has to be future. Now that will happen at Armageddon. It will happen at the end of the millennium, the final Gog and Magog. In the millennium, the place the Jew in their God places the Jew in their land, and they're the power of the world. And the lion of the tribe of Judah is their ruler. Uh, he represents the nation. So there, the lion is matching up. Matthew twenty-seven. Matthew 27, 37. We covered this a little bit this morning. Matthew 27, 37. I gave it to you out of John this morning. Here it is out of Matthew. This is Pilate. And he set up over his head his accusation written. This is supposed to be an accusation. I think it's a compliment. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That's powerful. Imagine a heathen proclaiming the deity of God, the king of the Jews. Yes, he is. In the millennium, um, of course, he will be a reigning king. He was not king when he came the first time, but he will the next time because he's not asking anybody. <laughs> he came and they were supposed to accept him. When they rejected him, he said, okay, that was your choice. Next time it won't be. <laughs> Next time he comes back with a rod of iron. Uh, look at it in Genesis 3. All through the Bible, you see this, um, this theme that runs through it about a king and about a kingdom. And uh, the king showed up. They put him on a cross on Calvary, um, the place of a skull. And crowned him with thorns well that's not going to work the next time he comes he's not giving anybody a second a second smack you know they say if you if your uh, enemy smacks you on the cheek you turn the other cheek well you better know when to do it and when not to jesus christ doesn't he came to earth once and they smacked him put him on a cross he's coming back a second time and he's not turning another cheek uh, genesis 3 verse 15 and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The hill, Christ's hill, was bruised at Calvary. But soon he's coming back, and he's going to crush the serpent. They put Christ on Calvary, the place of a skull, and soon he's coming back, and he's going to land on the skull, and he's going to bruise it. Romans chapter 16. This is all future. It has to be tribulation. You'll find people who will tell you that it happened at his first advent. That he took over and he became king when he came to earth. He did not. He's still future to be king. He's not king yet. Right now he's prince of peace. A prince is someone who's soon to take over as king. Romans 16 verse 20. And the God of peace shall, that's future, bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Okay, that's Paul saying it's not happened yet. One day it will. So that puts your timeline in the Bible. That tells you when the events happen. Satan has not been crushed. You'll find your, uh, is it, I guess the millennial think that the kingdom has already come. And it's a spiritual kingdom. There's no physical to it. And it's crazy. If this is the kingdom, it ain't going too well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's all future. 
the second coming is when all this takes place and that's when Israel gets back on top Micah 5 verse 9 Matthew 5 verse 9 thine okay who's the thine probably a reference to Israel hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries and all thine enemies shall be cut off definitely has not happened to Israel I know they wish they had that verse fulfilled today they've got some enemies after them right now bombing them left and right I heard that uh, of course I'm not over there I don't know I heard that they were being bombed uh, I think 90 bombs missiles or something were sent over and they've got that iron dome which repelled 90% of them and what it did was it sent the 90% back where they came from so they were bombing themselves <laughs> that's the way God works that's pretty good he says, all thine enemies shall be cut off. Look at it in Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. God can either do something miraculous and send an angel down to wipe out a whole army, or he could use the power of man and empower him to do something, like we were talking about with those bombs falling back on the people sending them over. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure. Ooh, buddy, isn't it some kind of measure? And will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Israel is going to be corrected, but soon they're going to get exactly what he intended for that nation. They'll be ruling the earth. Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46 verse 28 we saw where Cyrus was called the anointed and the servant and um, the same titles given to the Messiah and given to Israel as a nation Jeremiah 46 28 fear thou not O Jacob my servant that is the the Israelite has um, an office he's supposed to fulfill according to God he's his servant Thus saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. Said it twice in the same book. I think we're supposed to pay attention to that. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty tough. He says, you're going to get what's coming to you, but don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. Now that's exactly what he says to a Christian nowadays. You've not replaced Israel, but he's going to treat you as the same father. He's going to treat you similarly. Look at it in Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel 11, verse 16. Ezekiel eleven sixteen. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, they still are. Yet will I be to them a little sanctuary in the countries, whither they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Now, when does that get fulfilled? How does that get fulfilled? I know there's many times you can say it happened. When Cyrus allows them to go back, then they're coming out of those countries. Um, it didn't go too well when they did. Um, there's another time it happens when the Antichrist shows up, offers them peace, reestablishes temple service. They all flock back in. They're going to be, you know, religious Jews again. And that doesn't work out too well. Um, he smashes them to next to nothing at Armageddon. And then regathers them again and makes them a nation. Now that's probably the one he's in making a reference to. Uh, Amos 9, Amos 9 verse 8. Amos 
Amos 9, verse 8. He's taught God speaking here about Israel. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. What a way to talk about your kids. You're a sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. And now he takes a breath, counts to ten, and says, Saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. I can see him right now. This sin has multiplied and it's become status quo among my people and I can't even stand that kingdom. I look at that and I say, that looks just like the heathen or worse. I'm going to destroy it. Oh yeah, I do remember you, Abraham. Um, not other, utterly. I, I'll leave a few of you there. <laughs> Micah 5 verse 10. Micah 5, verse 10. Here's God. Here's, this is how he's going to correct Israel. Micah 5, verse 10. And it shall come to pass in that day. That day is Armageddon or tribulation. That day, don't, don't lose sight of this fact. When he comes back at Armageddon, he's not only destroying the Antichrist and all of the other nations, he's also destroying Israelites who aligned themselves with them. That's why he says in Revelation, Come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins. That you Be not partakers of her punishment. Okay, well, she's going to be punished. And along with her is all those who stayed to help her or were enjoying the benefits of that friendship. He says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. He's going to set off an EMP that makes all of their uh, war, modern war vehicles useless. Or, it means exactly what it says, they've gone back to using horses. And he's just going to give all the horses uh, uh, some kind of a, a thing where they can't move. <laughs> They're paralyzed. 2 Kings 7. Second Kings seven. Israel's going to be in the same boat as though they as those they've run to to get help. Unless you run to God, you've gone to a loser. <laughs> Second Kings seven, verse thirteen. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain which are left in the city. Behold, they are all as the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as the multitude of Israel, we heard you the first time, of Israel that are consumed, and let us send and see. Okay, you know the story. Uh, they're going to go out there. They were talking about we're going to eat horses now. Many times Israel's been under siege. That's one way he gets them to destroy their own animals. You know, God can make a man self-destruct by his own choice you wouldn't think a man would cannibalize himself but he talks about it he says you're going to eat the flesh off your own arm yeah that's what he says that's uh, that's pretty powerful that's a mad god when he makes a man decide he's going to do that to himself here he says i'll just i've i've been so uh fed up with that sinful nation sinful kingdom that I'll turn them over to a position where they have no choice but to eat their own animals. Hmm. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, 16. You know, an Israelite was not supposed to have horses. There shouldn't be any horses for them to eat. They were supposed to have mules and donkeys, no horses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, and to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. It was too fast a transportation. That's good of God. He puts caution signs out. 
And every time you pass a caution light, what you've done is you've injured yourself, not him. He says right here, don't have horses. That'll keep you from getting the speed and being able to travel as fast as you think you can to get back to Egypt when the going gets rough. Uh, and all of these rules and regulations, a man looks at and says, well, that's not really that bad. You know, how dare you tell me that? But it leads to something. It opens the door to something else you think now is not so bad until you're back in Egypt. Psalm 20, Psalm 20, verse 7. Psalm 20, verse 7. We read this verse and we think um, that's perfectly normal. It's, it, you know, it's not any big deal. That anybody could have wrote a flowery wording like this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, imagine a general. This is King. King David. The king of the massive army that's just punishing the world. Anybody that comes against them, stands against them, cannot stand. And he says this. It'd be like our, whoever the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or something gets up and says, some people are trusting in the military and the artillery and, you know, the nuclear weapons and all that, but we, we trust in the name of our Lord, our God. He's, he's the one in charge of the army. And he says, I don't even trust in these people. Yeah, I've been teaching them how to use a bow. We've spent years and years on it. They finally understand how to do the katas. But I'm going to tell you, we're not even going to trust those. Now, that's where power comes from. The Almighty. 1 Kings 10. 1 Kings 10, verse 26. Solomon wasn't quite as close to God as his dad, David. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots, and with a king at Jerusalem. He was loaded to the hilt with all the greatest, I think when I read this verse, what I see is in Russia, I can't remember what they call it, every year they do a, a, a military parade, and they parade out, and China does this too, they parade out all of their military people and they do their little dances and no, it's not dances, they get mad if I call them to dance, but <laughs> they do their little things and show how powerful and mighty they are and what new weapons they have. And it's supposed to get all the people riled up to, you know, support their nation. This is what Solomon has done. He's gathered in horses when Israel didn't have horses before. He's got all these chariots and he's got this amassed army out there and it's just going to instill confidence in the king uh, but it didn't go too well uh, soon Solomon goes down look at 1st Kings 10 28 and Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt whoa that doesn't sound good that'd be like me calling North Korea and saying y'all got any weapons for sale <laughs> that, that's not very smart and linen yarn and the king's merchants received the yarn at a price. Yeah, it was at a price. The price of his kingdom, it divides right after him. Um, well, we've, we've already hit our time. Uh, we'll pick up at Micah 5.11. Micah 5.11 after this. And from here on, it's going to be um, easier to understand. The, fir <laughs> the first half of that chapter, there's some difficult spots, but from... From here on, it smooths out. Micah 5.11 is where we'll start next week.